Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the last PCC Forum of the fall semester. Thank you all for coming in the rain and uh, coming to hear this, what I know will be an amazing lecture. The last time I introduced Robert at the PCC Forum, I attempted to go through his entire career and realized that it is so marv marvelously full of uh, wonderful things that he has done and participated in that I would take up the whole lecture time if I were to do that again. So I'll just give you a few highlights. Robert is the chair of the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness program, where he's also a professor here at CIS, and he's the former president of CIS as well. And I can safely say that he probably saved the school from ruin at that time. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I'm getting looks for saying that. Um, last week, Robert celebrated his 50th wedding anniversary with his wife, Ellen, and um, Matt and I were lucky enough to be able to see part of that celebration. And I was just thinking about, you know, the amount of devotion, dedication, and love that it takes to be in a marriage for 50 years. And I feel like Robert brings that same dedication and love to his place here at CIS and um, that same dedication to all of his students as well. So please join me in welcoming Robert McDermott. Thank you, Becca. Thank you, Becca. Thank you. Thank you for coming to hear about Margaret Fuller, who did not have such an enjoyable life as my wife and I have had. So it's a, I'm, I'm warning you, this is, this is a kind of a hard biography to, to hear about. I mean, amazing, of course, but also hard. And that's the point of the talk, actually, that it was hard to, be a, to try to be a professional woman in uh, the early centuries of, uh, early decades of 19th century America. Maybe of anywhere, and maybe it, you know, long after that, but nevertheless, it certainly was the case in her life uh, in the, up until uh, uh, her, her death in uh, 1850. Uh, so she wrote, uh, in the chamber of death I prayed in very early years. So she was quite precocious in keeping track of her thoughts and aspirations, her dreams, even as a teenager. And this is what she wrote. Give me truth. Cheat me by no illusion. Give me truth. Cheat me by no illusion. Oh, the granting of this prayer is sometimes terrible to me. I walk over the burning plowshares and they sear my feet. Yet nothing but the truth will do. So, uh, the two books I recommend are John Madison, The Lives of Margaret Fuller, uh, which is not just, you know, day by day. It's really quite probing and um, insightful. Uh, and a very remarkable book. It was on my shelf for years before I cracked it just a few years ago. Uh, Belle Gale Javigny, the, uh, the Woman and the Myth, Margaret Fuller's Life and Writings. And she's done a great job of weaving uh, um, pieces about her at, uh, corresponding or contemporaneous with pieces by her. And so it's... Um, contemporaries and Fuller's writing, contemporaries and Fuller's writings, and it goes through that five or six times. Very, very well done. A lot of work and many letters. I don't know where these, these biographers are amazing for their patience and finding letters, not just, I mean, in the, in the Madison, not just letters by Fuller or to Fuller, but letters from a friend of hers to another friend of hers about her. That's thorough kind of research. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to proceed pretty chronologically so you can get a, a sense for the, for the biography. Um, in other words, uh, I have themes, uh, the primary one being um, the theme of the woman, uh, uh, female, trying to be a professional uh, in um, America, 1830 to 40, uh, 50. Um, and then 
uh, her relationship to these famous people, which is partly why she's famous. Uh, I mean, for years I've known, I mean, practically since college I've known, oh, Margaret Fuller, yeah, she was a friend of Emerson, which is the one thing everybody knows about Margaret Fuller. If you know nothing else, you know that. If you know anything more than that, you're in a small percentage of people uh, who know more than that. Though some people know about her death as well. Uh, okay. Uh, so I believe that Margaret Fuller, though I'm not an expert in this, and I could be, I'm subject to correction, but it appears from what I've been able to find out that she is almost certainly the first uh, woman uh, or, or man, but it's likely to be a woman, um, to have written insightfully and in a, a sort of in a strong and clear evidential way about feminism in in America. She appears to be the first, because as you may know, uh, the, the sort of the silent spring of feminism, right? Silent spring by uh, Rachel Carson is credited with launching the ecological movement in uh, 1962. Um, and you can say, well, no, it was really Earth Day, but uh, more likely it was silent spring, 62. Uh, well, the corresponding moment in feminism was the uh, Seneca Falls Conference of 1848, uh, which uh, featured uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, the two great first, um, uh, um, not just theoreticians, but activists on behalf of feminism uh, in America. And they both acknowledge a Fuller as being the, the person who, who was the most influential with respect to the situation for women uh, up to that time. So that seems to me a pretty good cred uh, uh, for her. Um, they said she was the most widely, deeply read female, and no, I didn't say that, that I, I'm saying that, most widely, deeply read female in New England in mid 19th century. I always heard it said uh, in secondary sources, mostly about Emerson, that uh, she was the one person thought to be as knowledgeable and as intelligent as, as Emerson. Um, she clearly was learned and brilliant. All right, there are lots of other things come into the mix, but those two are factual. She was learned and brilliant, and I will tell a little bit about what she learned, how she learned it, and why it's clear that she was brilliant. Um, okay, but not easy to be learned and brilliant as a female. Uh, in uh, 18, uh, so she was born in 1810, all right, you can remember that, 1810, and she dies in 1850, um, so at age 40. So this is a very short life for such huge influence, all right? Okay, now uh, one of the things that you uh, can learn from her and about her, but uh, um, there's a lot more to learn about this than uh, uh, is usually articulated um, in a quick go through, uh, and that is the influence of Goethe. Um, so, uh, Goethe, uh, more than I think many people realize, uh, and other German Romantic, actually, what's well, complicated? Okay, I'll just say German Romantic thinkers, uh, uh, German thinkers of the um, first few decades of the 19th century were tremendously influential in, uh, in the United States, but particularly on the East Coast, but also in St. Louis, uh, other places, um, sorry, uh, Boston, New York, I know those two places, and St. Louis. Um, they, uh, so that as there were uh, uh, journals uh, devoted to translating and uh, publishing uh, their writings, uh, Emerson, who was, um, was not all that good at languages and did not, had not studied German, which kind of surprised me that he didn't study German at, at Harvard, but it said he didn't know German and that he learned German in order to read Goethe. And he ordered uh, from Germany and read the full 55 volumes of Goethe. Uh, in German, in which he did not excel. Uh, this is devotion. Um, now, on the one hand, Goethe seemed to be the, the most important figure of this group of figures, including uh, Schiller and uh, Novalis 
uh, Schelling, um, Hegel, etc. Uh, at the same time, there's a very strong um, uh, pushback against him uh, because uh, he's not Christian. Uh, well, he's not American for one thing, and they were trying—they were trying to be patriotic. The seats over here. Come. I'm happy to see you. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm just talking about Goethe's influence uh, on uh, uh, Emerson and Fuller and uh, a lot of these people, uh, but I guess mostly on those two. Um, so uh, the important part about this is not Goethe's um, color theory or uh, metamorphosis, uh, uh, but his uh, conviction, which is central to the Faust, that uh, the, uh, the, the meaning of life, not just the meaning, but the, the way to salvation. It's not, it's not, I'm not totally clear what he meant by salvation, but it didn't mean nothing for him. Uh, um, uh, the way to salvation is by a, a life totally devoted to striving. So at the end of the second part, Faust, Faust part two, uh, they, uh, 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 in a way that I found quite annoying, and perhaps you, this, you have the same idea, I don't know, uh, that the angels save him. I and mean, some of you read a, a, um, an invocation to Sophia that I wrote, and there's a line in it that just occurred to me uh, that said, uh, a, a Faust the rascal, um, uh, that and he, wasn't, he was not, I didn't think, worthy of being saved. But the angels say that uh, if a person strives for a life, we can save that person. All right? So it's, uh, that's good, good. We're still getting started. Um, so uh, at, I think, more than any other single intellectual influence, Goethe's idea that uh, the meaning of life is striving, uh, uh, had a grip on, on uh, Fuller. And <clears throat> it's both, as any tight uh, idea or ideal or conviction is likely to do, it played out both positively and negatively. All right, so positively she kept going and going and going, and negatively she kept going and going and going and, and was, was willing to pay any price, and indeed she did. Um, okay, so uh, the, the, angels, the angels said, uh, uh, as a, let's see, after I, uh, I had the quote here, it's okay, you, you get the idea. Uh, so she re we referred to this many times, she was, more than anything, a Goethean. She translated the, um, um, several of his works, including the Conversations with Eckerman, which is, who is Goethe's uh, assistant, who seems to have done nothing but write down <laughs> everything that, that Goethe said, uh, and then uh, uh, published it. And it was 420 pages, and uh, Fuller, who did not learn German early, she learned Latin and Greek early, but she then uh, learned uh, German uh, as a young adult and then did this, uh, I guess, actually from her late teens and early 20s, she read for about three or four years, she read almost nothing but Goethe in German. Uh, so then she did this uh, translation and she was desperate to um, write a life of Goethe. Uh, uh, and when she was convinced that she couldn't uh, write it without going to Germany to visit Weimar and visit uh, Italy and all the places where, where Goethe uh, uh, lived and wrote about. And then the Panic of 1837, which we probably all heard about in some history course or other, but here's a place where it actually touched, right? Somebody we know that um, she couldn't go to, um, to um, Europe uh, because the, the family, what little money there was in the family was then uh, lost and the panic lasted for five years, a really serious downturn. Um, so she wasn't able to write the biography of, of Goethe, but she did two enormous translations, one of which she sent to her friend Henry Hedge um, in 1834 and uh, 
He then, it seemed like it took him two years to do this, but anyway, he eventually got it to Emerson in 1836, uh, when Emerson uh, was just publishing Nature, and then he was about to do the Divinity School Address and Self-Reliance, so Emerson was about to uh, emerge, and his uh, translation uh, came, and he found it uh, uh, competent or something, and he then uh, told Henry Hedge, uh, that uh, he would like to see this uh, translator. So I'm, a, I'm ahead of where we want to be, but I wanted to give you this idea uh, early on that uh, the her, her modus operandi is striving. She is going to do what it needs, to, what she needs to do to realize the truth, uh, and I would say the truth of her being. She's really trying to do what she what she came to do. You'll see. A uh, couple times when she, um, uh, at certain critical moments in her life, when she asked the question, uh, "What? Who am I? What am I? And what am I to do?" It's very. It's all. She didn't. I don't know that she ever says the word karma, but that's what she's talking about. Okay. Um, so other themes besides Goethe are transcendentalism, uh, obviously feminism, which is the point of the talk. Um, and, and some others uh, also is, I think, is kind of an interesting thing uh, to uh, track the, um, the pretty tough um, intolerance of the Christians. I mean, almost everybody who stuck their head up and said something was likely to get pounced on by some minister or some... Christian group or something in a pretty powerful way. It, it's really like, ooh, there they, there they are again. And they beat her up quite a bit. Okay, let's go to her, her life. Um, and those of you who are sort of family conscious of the influence of, of you know, one parent, the other parent, and the child rearing, and et cetera, you would have to be very, very interested and with lots of uh, opinions about the, um, the parents. So the, um, the and, and they're both important in different ways. One positively, the other, um, no, they're, they're both mostly negative, but one by action, the other one by uh, neglect, or maybe that's not the right word, by, uh, by passivity, right. Okay, so the father um, was a successful, he was a Harvard uh, lawyer, which even then meant a lot, um, uh, who uh, uh, had a career in, in politics. Uh, he was in the Massachusetts Senate. He was a, a congressman in Washington. Um, he um, was extremely ambitious, uh, competitive, uh, uh, as you'll see with her, but also in his life. Um, uh, pr pretty fiercely competitive and rather materialistic, determined to get ahead. Uh, he didn't come, he wasn't born ahead, but he uh, set out to, to get ahead. And um, uh, he had four brothers, all extremely ambitious and materialistic. And we're going to see one of them, uh, Abraham, having a very, uh, really negative effect on um, uh, Margaret's life. Okay, um, the, so at age, um, when Margaret was three, a, um, a uh, sister died um, at 14 months, so they were very close in age, and this was um, uh, tremendously painful for both parents. A lot of deaths, if you, Emerson, a huge number of deaths in this family too. Yes, probably everybody at that time, um, it seemed like. Uh, so uh, when the um, this second child died, either, either this was the occasion or the cause or something complicated that entered into the father's absolute determination to uh, make Margaret, quote, the heir to all he knew. Uh, he, he wanted her to, to learn, embody, and advance all of his knowledge. And he was properly educated, Latin and Greek, 
And so he began to teach her at age four. Uh, she was uh, doing Greek. And five they, uh, or six, she, he added Latin. By nine, she was freely translating Latin and Greek and uh, steeped in the classics. She was reading Sophocles and Virgil and et cetera at, and translating at nine. Uh, so clearly she had great intelligence. And she also had um, a, uh, a very oppressive situation because he would come home from, from uh, the office, wherever he was, uh, and uh, uh, required to, her, to show her homework or uh, translations. Uh, and he would keep her up late at night working on her translations of Latin and Greek. Um, and this continued, really, until uh, she was a teenager when she uh, uh, then, in a certain sense, was transferred from his tutelage to the school, which was much more humane. But by this time, she was, um, she was an oddity. She, was, she had a hard life. Let me turn to the mother, and then I think you'll see why um, she really had no place to go. So the father has instilled in her the, a career which would be extremely ambitious even for a, a male who was going then to Harvard or Yale uh, and, and a career in law uh, would, or ministry, would, she would already be ahead of most of them. Uh, but for a female, there was absolutely no outlet, as we will see again and again and again uh, in her life. All right, now the mother, uh, who was uh, not uh, very uh, cheerful, uh, was uh, tall, uh, kind of ungainly, um, not um, charming, um, and uh, very passive. Uh, and she just kind of gave uh, Margaret to the, the father, Timothy, for him to educate her and to seem like to make all the decisions. But as far as I can tell, the only decisions were being made were about her education. So, uh, uh, the, the mother was uh, passive uh, about uh, Margaret, and they did not develop a mother-daughter bonding relationship. The mother then became more depressed, um, uh, uh, you know, in addition to her, her natural disposition, uh, at the death of this second child. Um, and then she very quickly, uh, I, I don't know how quickly, I shouldn't say that, I haven't counted up the years, but anyway, she did then have four more children, uh, and she was uh, uh, frequently tired and uh, preoccupied uh, with the younger children, and Margaret uh, kind of uh, was fending for herself with her, her books, her translations, and except for the garden, uh, she really had no other life. She had, uh, in these early years, uh, what we would call middle school, she had no friends. So it's, uh, her, um, her books really were her only friends. Uh, so it's a, it's a very abnormal childhood, abnormal education, um, and uh, we're going to see how it plays out. Uh, it's this, but there are important seeds already sown that will um, grow. Uh, okay. Um, all right, then um, she said herself, I had no natural childhood. If she knew what we know about child development, she'd have been even more horrified. Um, okay, and uh, there's a nice line in Madison where he says, she was beginning to learn that it's a very fine line between exceptional and abnormal. I thought that was quite good of him to see that. Okay, so she's about uh, 10 years old. And she's on, on a staircase, uh, and she's, she pauses. And suddenly, I don't know why a staircase, you know, but that's, that's when it happened. And she then gets these four questions kind of coming in on her, all right? Uh, how came I here? Um, how is it that I seem to be this Margaret Fuller? Uh, what does it mean? Uh, all right, is it just really... Like, wow, what? You ever got, you, you must have had that. And then, what shall I do? All right. Um, so she's desperate to be loved. She's, uh, and to have her father's approval, which is a 
really a problem all her life, as we'll see. Um, and she's ungainly. She's uh, much too intellectual. She's much too competitive. And she's not. She's not just not liked because she's intelligent. She's also not that likable. <laughs> all right. So she is competitive in a rather unpleasant, fierce way that she has to be superior just to prove herself, which is pretty easy to do in the intellectual realm. But she was um, quite uncompetitive in other realms, which she didn't care about, but other, <laughs> everybody else did care about. So the, the fault of the father was, of course, to over-educate her. But the fault of the mother was not to enable her to learn some skills that, that would enable her to be uh, accepted, all right, which would make the intellectual part somewhat less problematic and less painful. OK. Um, Goethe, in conversations with, with uh, a conversation with Goethe, the, uh, Eckermann's conversation with Goethe, says, in a young lady, we love beauty, but understanding does not fire our hearts or awaken our passions. Alas, that was true of a, a lot of people around Margaret Fuller whose hearts were not uh, 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 inflamed by the appearance uh, or the personality and the modus operandi of this brilliant teenager. OK, fortunately, in the, um, in the teen years, she then shifted from the Greek and Latin classics uh, to Shakespeare very heavily, also Moliere and Cervantes and some others, which seems like was a really good idea to do Shakespeare. That's good for everybody uh, whenever. She had one respite in this kind of grim uh, educational program. A, uh, a person named Ellen uh, Kilsham, Kilsham, I guess, uh, 21, when uh, Margaret was about 10, came and stayed in the house and um, really introduced her to a little, a lighter, a lighter femininity uh, and taught her something about uh, beauty and grace and conversation and all kinds of things that she really hadn't learned and needed to learn. But she still didn't learn enough. So, uh, this, uh, Ellen stayed about a year and then she went back to England. Um, and we'll see that when uh, Margaret went to uh, the Cambridge Port Private Grammar School, uh, she, of course, excelled and dazzled everybody and also alienated um, uh, all, of the, all of the students. And then at 11, she went to the Boston Lyceum for young ladies. And you can get a picture of her situation because uh, she, after some months, uh, decided to have a party. It might have been a Christmas or a birthday party. I'm not sure. Uh, but there was an occasion. And she invited uh, all of the students. There were 90 of them. And about three came. And it was completely devastating. I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but it's not pleasant. <laughs> it's not. Even if you hear about it, it's unbearable. And if it happens to you, it's really, really bad. Uh, and she said, oh, well, a few came. But uh, it was hard. Um, OK, then at uh, 15, she's at uh, Miss Prescott's Young Ladies Seminary in Groton, which was very still a little bit rural, and it was certainly rural then. And she was uh, uh, quite miserable, except because she had no friends. And she um, she's uh, uh, living in, 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 in the mind all the time. And she cannot get any responses from her father. So she wrote quite a few letters, and there was no response. And then she wrote uh, him a letter and that said, I cannot impress you goodbye. And she did not write to him again for five years, from 15 to 20. <laughs> so she's, you know, she's strong. She's really strong. You, you stay tuned. She is strong. <laughs> OK, so. Um, but the father then got involved as, uh, after uh, some time because it, word came back from the school and from the parents of some um, children who knew them that she was a spectacle in polite society because she was always arguing and putting down people who knew less than her, which was everybody. So uh, it was, and that's when they began to say to each other, uh, fortunately, the father as well as the mother, we've made a mistake. This is a kind of a Frankenstein that we've created. Uh, and so 
Um, and it was not not just because of what she knew, it's because of what she didn't know about how to have conversation and how to give a little space and etc. Okay. Um, so at 19, she had a, um, an affection. Uh, I, I think it's the first one. Uh, a man named George Davis, who then just, who was kind of friendly with her, and then she sort of let it be known that she you know, would like to have more of a relationship, and he just uh, dropped her uh, in a way that was quite painful. But she had, by this time, two or three good male friends and one of them, uh, James Freeman Clark, who stayed her friend all of her life, um, helped her get, uh, get over this. And I think she kind of liked him too, but she wasn't, several times she sort of was interested, but she doesn't really quite know what, and then she comes on too strong, or she requires this, or she has to be in the superior role, and then she scares them away. Um, Okay, oh, the passage I was looking for from the angels in Faust says, whoever strives with all his power, we are allowed to save, from the Faust part two. Okay, uh, then she wrote in this, um, she wrote a 40-page 40 es 40 essay on Goethe, so when she's then uh, 23, uh, and she wrote in her diary that if she could meet Goethe, he, he would affirm her life and her struggle. This is, this is really, and then of course he died in 1832 when she was, uh, actually he'd already died because uh, she wrote that at 23 and he, she was 22 uh, when he died. Um, so that was a, a, big, a big loss for her. Of course he was uh, very elderly, but still she had just could have gotten to him. Then at 25, she went to uh, Trenton Falls I don't know by name, uh, in, um, in New York. Um, and it was very, uh, I'm thinking, I'm picturing it around Buffalo. Anyway, she went there with two friends and uh, the falls were a terrifying experience for her. And she had this sense that the, the power of the water was somehow overwhelming her senses. And it was quite terrifying. And then I'll skip ahead a little bit. Uh, later on, she went to another trip that included the Niagara Falls, and it was absolutely terrifying. And she actually felt herself being pulled uh, into the falls and, and drowning. Um, uh, then, uh, uh, let's see, um, ah, she met Harriet Martineau, you know, who is the, the uh, um, uh, you know, uh, de to almost at de Tocqueville, right? Uh, de Tocqueville being a French who came and did this, in nine months wrote this two volume brilliant analysis of American society. Uh, Martineau uh, came at approximately the same time, uh, French, and had uh, some of the same information as uh, de Tocqueville, but many different perceptions. It really is a classic case of what a man saw and what the, what the woman saw of very much the same situation. It's a great, great dissertation for somebody if it hasn't been written. Um, so she met uh, Martineau and Martineau had, and she had conversations about the situation of women in America, which in some respects was much worse than in Europe. And uh, this was sort of her first chance to meet a famous writer and a, particularly a female and somebody who really understood uh, something about the role of women in America. Um, when she was uh, 26, um, she was ill uh, and they were afraid she might die because um, uh, a lot of these uh, um, epidemics going around, uh, cholera and typhus and etc. cetera. Uh, so she was very, very ill and her father gave her what appears to be the first compliment that he had ever given her, <laughs> right? And, and she, you could almost feel like it enabled her to recover. Uh, and because he didn't say that he loved her. He said he was impressed by her. And he said, I think you don't have any faults. You, of course, have failings or, no, not failings. What was the other word? Um, you don't have faults, uh, something. I don't know if I wrote it down. But anyway, he, he, he complimented her. Not the same thing as, I love you, darling. Please get better. Um, so, uh, and then, just almost immediately thereafter, um, 
they were, at this time, he had bought a farm, a very foolish idea. He was 55. He was in no position to do heavy farming. Uh, they, they lost money. They, they all were miserable. And he, there was some polluted water nearby that he was doing something with, and he caught uh, an Asiatic flu, and he came in the house, and it seemed like in a matter of hours, he was dead, truly. Um, and she, he was, so they carried him up to his bed, which was actually pretty dangerous since he was highly polluted uh, and contagious. And she closed his eyes and she said, that was, she said, I think that was the holiest deed that I've ever done. And I haven't quite figured that out, what's the holiness of it. Uh, it seems to me certainly profound and memorable. I don't know quite what's going on there. Um, but she made a point of saying that was the holiest deed I've ever done. Um, and so the father died and the finances got worse and worse because uh, here's another feminist element that keeps coming, that uh, the mother, uh, and at least of all the daughter, but not even the mother, had control of their own finances. The money went to the brother Abraham, who gave very little to them and did not, was not willing to spend any money on the, the uh, uh, Margaret's or the brother's educations. And he said they don't need to go to Harvard. Uh, and uh, it was really tough. They, they were really in, in a hard time. And Abraham, who didn't need the money, was holding it and basically um, uh, had a very, very low opinion of, of, of the family. There's one here, Kat. Um, OK. Um, when, the, when the father uh, is just about, uh, clearly about to die any minute or hour, she says, if. Um, uh, she says, I will, I think it's partly influenced by this compliment or maybe just the seriousness and the, the drama of the situation. She says, I will uh, be loyal to my brothers. Basically, I'll, I'll be the, the senior person in the family, which was a vow that she kept and it was not easy. Um, uh, at least one of them was um, not a good investment. Um, then she wrote, she's a 26, and she wrote, all youthful hopes of every kind I have pushed from my thoughts. All youthful hopes of every kind I have pushed from my thoughts. You know, I can now see that the great person I was going to be, I'm not going to be. Usually that happens in the 40s, <laughs> 50, or sometime mid, right? But this is 26. Uh, she's already done a lot of living. Um, then she says, all this may be very unlovely, but it is I. So she really needed, she, that was in a letter to her friend, James Freeman Clark. Okay, then the panic comes, the uncle the, keeps the money, um, and um, we're moving along, she's 27. And then um, at 26, she sends her, her translation to uh, uh, Henry Hedge, uh, Torquato Tasso, which you must know, I don't know, uh, by Goethe? Minor work, I guess. Um, well, anyway, he then sent that to, uh, uh, to Emerson. Uh, I might, before I might have said that, that it was uh, um, the conversation with Eckerman, which she does send to Emerson, but that's not the first piece she sends to Emerson. So he then would like to meet her, and uh, Henry Hedge, who uh, um, was a good friend all of her life, uh, uh, arranges that, and now we have to do a little bit about Emerson, since that's, <laughs> I mean, that's mostly how she's known. Oh yeah, Margaret Fuller, she was a friend of Emerson. Uh, and it is true, uh, she was a friend of Emerson. There's a book that I read a couple years ago called Emerson Among the Eccentrics. That's an annoying title, uh, but it, it is Emerson and these people, Alcott and Ripley and, um, and Fuller and the person named, uh, uh, what's the name? Very, the poet? Very, very? The first name? Anyway, Very, uh, whom I've not read, but I, I come across him. Um, so, Emerson uh, and uh, the big house, which he referred to as Bush, which was silly because it's a fabulous, it was a fabulous stately home in Concord, uh, was very much the center of uh, a group of writers, thinkers, uh, idealists. Uh, who come to be called transcendentalists. But I have to go back a little bit, and for those of you who don't know Emerson, 
um, there's, uh, by the time she meets Emerson, he's had a lot of life. Um, so uh, Emerson, uh, uh, as a, uh, was the, um, uh, was slated to be a minister, he became a minister, and at uh, 29, uh, he uh, walks from the ministry because he cannot, um, uh, he cannot represent the Eucharist for what it's supposed to mean. He, he, he wrote an essay a little later saying that uh, no ritual can be asked to bear such a burden uh, in a community as what the, the Eucharist was thought to represent, namely the indication of who is and who is not in the grace of Jesus Christ. So it's, um, uh, he then leaves uh, his pulpit in, in Boston and he becomes a writer and a lecturer. And then at, um, uh, at 28, uh, he uh, marries a woman named uh, Ellen Tucker uh, from paintings and uh, photographs, but paintings, very, very beautiful, uh, uh, also wealthy, uh, every good thing, according to uh, Emerson, uh, and uh, just gracious and divine and loving and whatever. Uh, she was 20, no, she was only 18, on just turning 19, uh, and he was uh, 28, and uh, it was a very, apparently, reportedly a very uh, beautiful uh, um, love affair, uh, but she already had tuberculosis. And whether he thought or they thought that she could be cured or not, I don't know, but almost the entire 18 months of their marriage, she was dying. She then did die, and in the, one of the strangest pieces about Emerson's biography, about anybody's biography, is that after a year, he had the grave uh, opened because he, he couldn't he needed to see her one more time and he couldn't believe that she was really dead I mean he could believe it and he couldn't believe it uh, and he just needed something he needed somehow to connect with her it's a very very strange uh, uh, situation um, and then uh, about three years later two or three years later he was giving a lecture no I think or maybe a sermon it was a sermon in Plymouth and um, a woman named uh, Lydian, uh, um, who um, was impressed, and he was impressed by her, and this was very much a um, kind of uh, a marriage that did not have the spark, the passion of not only or young love or even any love. Uh, they were very good to each other. They were very, very good to each other. Um, but it was, it was more like friendship. It had a certain calm, settled quality. And one of the reasons for that is, in his case, um, because he had already lost Ellen, but in addition to that, he lost both of his brothers, both of whom very, very fine people, thought to be brilliant and et cetera. And they grew up. Uh, without a father, his, because Emerson's father died at seven, and so these uh, three brothers were very, very close intellectually, personally, in every kind of way. Um, and then both of them died. Then Ellen died. So by this time, he's had a lot of sorrow. Uh, and it's very interesting, when I used to hear about, um, uh, yeah, I used to uh, hear or read even comments about Emerson being sort of optimistic or too positive or something or other. It's just not true. Uh, Emerson is, is tremendously, uh, he is, he's tremendously stoic. He really has a deep relationship to, to pain and suffering, uh, and maybe not evil, but to, to suffering, to death, a lot of death. Okay, so he and Lydian did have a um, beautiful, uh, Beautiful, a positive, successful uh, relationship. Uh, and, but not easy for her because, I mean, he's Mr. Emerson, and in fact, she called him Mr. Emerson. Um, and I, yeah, she called him Mr. Emerson. Uh, and, 
uh, and all these people coming in and out, including uh, Henry David Thoreau, who got a lot of credit for living in Walden Pond, but actually he came up and had a bath in, in Lydian Emerson's house every night <laughs> and, and talked to her until she was exhausted. Uh, um, and all these other people in and out. Uh, uh, and uh, including uh, when uh, 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 dear Margaret gets a chance he sends word that he, she should come and visit him, and she does. She stayed for three weeks. And uh, Lydia, at this point, is pregnant and tired and uh, taking care of, et cetera. Well, you get the picture. And, and uh, in this Madison book, which you can tell I really enjoyed, uh, he says, the, the wives of the transcendentalists did not have an easy lot. Uh, and I can see how that could be true. Uh, uh, Thoreau was kind not to marry because he would have been the worst of all of them. Uh, okay, so she then uh, uh, gets a chance to talk to him and uh, it's not altogether successful. Uh, he says she has a high squeaky voice. Uh, she talks too much and too fast. Uh, she's just is sort of over the top with enthusiasm and passion and excitement and etc. cetera. Uh, but then he says, but then after a while, he said, I, I did kind of get to enjoy it because it was about everybody we both knew. <laughs> and he said her observations were quite shrewd. All right, which, of course. Um, so th three weeks, and she unpacked everything she ever thought <laughs> in her 26 years. And he uh, was a very stately gentleman. I can't imagine Emerson without a tie and you know a jacket and calm, probably mourning his brothers and his wife and his etc. Um, sorry, this is uh, 1836, just when he's emerging. Nature is, becomes a big, big seller and a, and a great work. Um, okay, um, so I want to, um, then what else do I want to do with Emerson? Uh, I'm going to keep going with Emerson, even though it's slightly out of order. Um, so what is the relationship like? I read in, I think it was in Richardson a long time ago, uh, a big, wonderful book about Emerson, which gave me the impression that uh, Emerson was kind of erotically taken by, um, um, by Fuller. I, I don't think that's true. And I'm not certain that I shouldn't blame Richardson because it might not be in there, but it is one book that I read very carefully. Um, it's not, but here's what happened. Um, after the death of Emerson's son, Waldo, which pretty nearly <laughs> depleted whatever positivity uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson and his wife Lydian had left, was pretty much gone. They, they, Emerson said, I, I mean, I really, I, I can't go on. And I, he, I think he could have paid more attention to the mother, and I'm not sure he did. Um, but it was horrific, and there are pictures of him, of this little boy, Waldo, and, and uh, um, Fuller was completely enchanted, as apparently everybody was, by this beautiful little boy who then dies, and the, the Emerson and Lydian are standing there watching day after day after day. Um, so she came, Fuller came and visited him after the death of Waldo, and Emerson and um, uh, Margaret did have long walks at night. And, you know, probably, uh, I don't know if it was in the woods, but it was in, you know, in a rural uh, area and, and they talked. But Lydia, in the meantime, was home. Um, and I don't know exactly what he needed from her, uh, but I'm convinced that it was not uh, erotic and certainly not sexual. Um, uh, but it was something, some, something intellectual, some kind of conversation that was helpful to him at that time. Um, and it could be misinterpreted, but I think it shouldn't be. It, sh it, was, it was a senior and a junior of friends, male, female, uh, with him clearly in a, in a state of uh, unbearable pain. Um, I wish, you know, reading this material, as I have several times, that he had, had the three of them were sitting in the living room together. 
because Lydian was not unintelligent or un uneducated, but she was a very pious Christian. And he didn't, that was not, was not, um, it was not something that he could, um, he really became ex-Christian. Uh, you could say, oh, see, it's really in there, it's really in there. It's really not so much in there. Uh, oh, okay. Um, so that's, they, they stay pretty close, except, uh, I'd have to look at the notes for the exact date now, but there was a time when, um, uh, about maybe five years later, give me a little slack on that, um, uh, Fuller is going through a very hard time, and she's, she's quite depressed, and not actually fully in control of her thoughts and her behavior. And she writes some very strange letters, very grim letters, and somewhat um, polemical, argumentative, even a little insulting. And she, said, she writes to Emerson, I reach to you uh, as my father. Because she's always looking for the father, you know. And you were not there for me. And, I, and he didn't have anything to give emotionally. He was pretty dried, and he, he couldn't have done it if he had determined to. He just didn't have it. He didn't have it for Lydian, and he didn't have it for her. And uh, she gets pretty mad, and then there's this break. And Emerson, I thought, handled it pretty well. And he wrote to, to several people, um, she wants more than I can give. And maybe she just wants more than anybody can give. So, OK. Um, so that's, that's the Emerson part. Now I want to go back and do the, um, the schooling. So I had, you know, we, she was in the, uh, the uh, high school. Then she go, has to go to the farm. Then she's in her early 20s. Then she really comes back and has to care for the younger children, basically to educate them. Um, and then she starts, you know, to write. She's writing on Goethe. And then the next big chapter is... Um, she, um, she, Emerson and Ripley and uh, Alcott uh, want an editor for the dial, but I missed something, even before the, the, the dial. <clears throat> uh, Alcott, who was a kind of a dreamer, uh, did not support his family, a really um, very idealistic, romantic, extremely impractical, and a little bit in, in, uh, dogmatic, he was a teacher of children and was obsessed with um, trying to get children to t talk about their either pre-life or early life experiences. So there is a book that I, I know called How Like an Angel Came I Down, which is by him. But the book that he published was Conversations, I have it written here, Conversations with children about the Gospels. I think it's the same book. I'm not sure I didn't check it, because uh, I don't have it. Um, but this was his, his uh, intellectual, spiritual passion, is a rebirth, and he was dealing with the children with this. And so he had the school where Margaret Fuller was teaching, and then there was tremendous opposition to him from, uh, from Christian sources uh, who, uh, who accused him of pagan teaching and uh, filling children's minds with uh, crazy ideas and etc. And so uh, she then left that. Okay, so then of uh, Emerson and all these people coming in and out, some of them were quite remarkable and not, most of them not in agreement with each other, which is kind of strange because they're all called tr transcendentalists, but we'll see in a minute that doesn't really mean very much. Um, so they then wanted to have a journal and they thought, well, maybe Alcott could do it, except that he's so impractical, and this person and that person. And then Emerson offered it to, uh, to Fuller, which was, sounded like a great idea, because it's an outlet for all of her learning, all of her ideas, her writing, and she'd get paid. Because right? lots of times she's, this, I don't, in fact, I'm saying to myself, how, how is she living? Where's this, how is she, where's, with the clothes and the, and the food, etc. cetera. Um, 
So that's, that was supposed to be, it's called The Dial. It, it, it ran for about four years. Uh, the great historian of American thought and culture, Henry Steele Commager, uh, referred to it as um, a, uh, what you, a, um, uh, a univer a, a, uh, it's an education without a university, and it's a and it's spiritual without a church. Uh, he says, so it's just what we needed. Uh, they, they all said, what we need is an outlet for our writings. And so Fuller became the uh, the editor, and she wrote uh, uh, two fictional pieces, which are very complicated, about they really were about her and about women trying to break through and do something uh, significant and being blocked by the society. So she's really working on these themes all the time, which isn't helping the sales of the, of the dial. Um, and then his friends were all supposed to contribute and most of them uh, <laughs> had to, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, had, had to plant that time or had to uh, go on a journey or something and they all had an excuse and it was really hard for her to get um, contributions. She did get enough for the first issue, uh, but at Emerson's recommendation, it included pieces by Alcott uh, 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 called um, um, uh, uh, Oracles, what was it, something Oracle, I have it written, but anyway, Oracles and they were all uh, very imaginative, uh, presumptuous, pretentious, and not at all Christian. Um, so the Christians once again uh, pounced on the dial and pounced on, on Fuller as the editor. Uh, then at, toward the end, I'm skipping some things, but toward the end, um, uh, she wrote uh, what was called the lawsuit, which then became uh, uh, the, her, her major work called uh, uh, Women in 19th century. Is it women in 19th century America or just women? I think it's just women in 19th century. That became her major sort of intellectual feminist treatise about uh, the imbalance of privilege uh, of, of males and, and, and females, which we'll see more about. Oh yeah, Alcott's was called Orphic Sayings, uh, which were intentionally attacked. Okay. Um, now, one of the things about uh, um, the Alcott, she taught for Alcott two years and she didn't get paid. And it just seems to me so obvious that if she had been a male, she would have gone to him and said, damn it, give me my money. And I think she couldn't. And she just didn't have, I mean, she had lots of, of um, uh, we could say chutzpah, she had lots of competitive, but, but she also didn't have standing. She had, I mean, that's the, that's the place. It's, it's, she couldn't demand her money or her rights. She could argue. She could, uh, she could compete. But she couldn't get what was, what was owed to her. Again and again and again. Uh, first school and then Alcott school. And then with the dial, she was editor for about three and a half years. And she did not get paid. Uh, they overestimated what they would do by way of sales and how where, where the money went and etc. Uh, but she, but she couldn't go and felt she couldn't go to Emerson and say, hey, "You appointed me," and you know, I mean, he's he's not starving in this fabulous house and his fabulous fame and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And they, you know, they all knew people of affluence, uh, and she couldn't say, "You appointed me. You should pay me, or you should make sure I get paid, or something." So that's a kind of an interesting situation where in, in her personal dealings, uh, she was powerful. In fact, a little scary. Um, men in particular really didn't like to engage with her because she was too powerful. Um, and some of the women didn't either. But um, she seems to me, if I'm correct about this, she couldn't do it, let's say, institutionally. She couldn't do it about money or power. And she just said, oh, you know, I wish I could pay it. I wish I could pay it. Okay. Um, so uh, <clears throat> this uh, 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 woman in, in uh, 19th century was published in 1845. And it did sell. And she got, it was really her, as she said, it's my, my footprint on the earth. I've, I've, I've made a mark. All right, this is what I really think. And it was the first feminist uh, 
treatise in America. And, and the 1848 is just three years after. So it's, it's quite, it's really very, very important. Okay, uh, now is another whole chapter. Um, so her, uh, she has these conversations. Uh, Alcott had conversations too, where people would pay and come and just uh, talk with a person in the front of the room who knows more than the others, all right? Um, yeah, it's, I know, I, I, okay. Um, so, <laughs> uh, and so she decided this would be a may, way to make a living and deal with women, right? And, and she's, she created what was called conversations and uh, maybe a dozen women came and at least six or eight of them were wives of very, very prominent, you know, people in the Concord, Boston area, uh, wives of men who were friends of Emerson, all right, who, this is an outlet now where they can really talk intellectually and nobody could say that's stupid or, or pay no attention or as men tend to do, uh, uh, you know, uh, hear what a woman said and then five minutes later think attribute it to one of the men at the table. Um, so all, they've all been through all that, so here's our chance to be alone and talk intellectually with somebody who really knows a lot. And some of them left really impressed and happy and they're coming back, particular, uh, including um, uh, Lydia uh, uh, Emerson, who, who went from Concord to Boston. They were in Boston, a big deal uh, before trains. Um, and some of them were just really put off that she knows too much, she talks too much, and it's not Christian. Um, that keeps coming up. It's not Christian. It's not Christian. Because you notice when I was talking about what she was educated, she was educated in, uh, in the classics. She was not educated in the New Testament. But the New Testament was the coin of the culture. I mean, the, the Harvard lawyers were all educated in the New Testament as well as, of course, in Roman law. Uh, so it's, she really was, an, she was, didn't, wasn't part of that, that language at all. Uh, so some of them were offended that she's talking about all these pagan things and who needs uh, that. But it was pretty successful. One of the people there, persons there, was the wife of Horace Greeley, the editor of the, uh, the uh, Tribune in New York. And a uh, newspaper, very successful, uh, quite a politically astute, social liberal um, uh, person. Uh, who lived up right near the sort of the tip of Manhattan um, uh, with the Henry Hudson Bridges now in a little alcove on the Harlem River and he invited her to come and live there. And so she had this really nice situation when she lived with Horace and the wife. <laughs> the only bad thing was that the husband and wife fought at the top of their lungs all the time. <laughs> and and, and uh, it was a little hard for uh, sensitive uh, uh, Margaret. Uh, but she had a really good job as a writer uh, for the Tribune, and she was a really a culture critic. She wrote, she did theater reviews, music reviews, poetry, all kinds of stuff, and she was able to go down to uh, Union Square, uh, to a salon. I don't know if it was every week or every month, but she met the literary people of, of, uh, of Manhattan, and it was a, it was a pretty good life. Um, and for the first time, she got an experience of really poor people. Uh, she saw some when she went on that tour to upstate New York and, and she said it was just horrible, horrible ruffians. But this time she saw families, you know, sort of on the street and, you know, in, in, in the Bowery and Chinatown a little bit later, et cetera, um, hard situations. And she was pretty horrified. And she then became um, a, I would say a social radical. She started, she had kind of Marxist ideas, um, though it's a little early, so it wasn't quite Marx, um, early by 20 years. But those ideas, after all, Marx wasn't the first one to have these ideas. So she became uh, socially, politically, kind of, kind of radical, uh, and was writing about that in, in her columns uh, for, the, for the Tribune. Okay. Um, so then, uh, in, she did that for about four or five years, and then uh, um, she, he asked her to go to cover the revolutions 
uh, in Europe, particularly 1848, uh, which was you know, a whole series of, of revolutions uh, throughout, throughout Europe. And the big one was the uh, struggle in Italy between these various states, most, quite a few of which were controlled uh, by Austria. Um, and so it's, uh, it's very complicated because, uh, so Italy is, is Catholic and Austria is Catholic and is, France is involved in that. And the Pope, of course, is involved in that. And when she first goes there, the Pope seems really great because he's supporting the, uh, the troops that are um, trying to bring, bring these, unify the states, because Venice and Naples and Rome are all independent states. Uh, and the Pope is the, sing is the single most influential person. But then he refused, he blocked them from uh, fighting against Austria because Austria was a Catholic country. So for her and for a lot of other people, uh, he lost. This is uh, Pius IX. He lost all of his cred. Uh, and um, uh, she then uh, becomes very deeply involved. But I missed a piece that you now need to hear about. So she goes to uh, Italy to be the foreign correspondent. She's writing regularly back about uh, 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 the culture. She, you know, she's in... Um, She's in Venice, she's in uh, Florence and writing cultural things, but also the, the politics. And she comes and she meets a man quite by accident. They're at, at an event, or might have been something musical, whatever, and it's raining, and he offers to accompany her, and he's very polite. And um, she uh, he walks her home or whatever, because she really went alone. And uh, he's a very, very kind man, uh, uh, Angelo, and, uh, <coughs> Angelo Osoli. And uh, they get to be friends. And uh, they have spent a lot of time together. They're talking. Um, and uh, they become lovers. And she's then pregnant. And he, they're not married. And uh, it's not good news back in New England. It's not good news in Italy, especially because his family is connected to the Pope. One of his brothers is a, a guard in the Vatican. And, so, and is, uh, 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 that one, at least, is called a Marquis, uh, a Marquis. And so there's this very strong Catholic uh, element. And now she's pregnant and depressed. And uh, um, I, uh, the reading about this, I'm thinking, any minute he's going to leave her. Uh, but he doesn't. Uh, and it's a very curious relationship because uh, he is uneducated. And she is hyper-educated. Um, she is not ready to be a mother. I mean, she's really not ready at all, as you'll see, it gets worse. And he is very, very gentle and very kind. Uh, so I, mean, I think, you know, she wanted a wife. You know, she wanted somebody to be kind and, and uh, not intellectually competitive, right, in that traditional sense, you know what I mean. Um, and she wanted somebody she didn't have to fight with, compete with, and who would be kind to her. And he was. Um, so then what do they do about this baby? Well, they, they, they don't tell anybody in the United States. Not the mother, not Emerson, nobody. Um, and uh, they have the baby, but they leave uh, uh, the city and they go off to a kind of a rural place and she has the baby and he's very kind. Uh, but then the revolution really starts in earnest and she meets some major Mazzini and some other major revolutionaries uh, and they, then they back into Rome, you know, on the Corso, which is, you know, the, where the revolution is. Uh, and uh, he uh, is called, because he was part of the, the Vatican Guard, he gets called to the front line and could have been killed any minute, especially since he doesn't really know anything about war. I mean, he, he's a, just a, a gentle guy. And uh, she then really takes over a, a hospital uh, where the soldiers are being brought in, you know, with their face knocked off. It's like Whitman in, you know, the Civil War. Uh, and this is totally new for her. And she emerges as this tremendously practical, powerful person, organizing the, 
the, you know, the blood supply and who gets triage and who gets the saved and whatever else. And he's, they don't know where, um, they don't know where each other is. And she's brought the baby, uh, little Nino, uh, out of the city to be cared for by somebody who doesn't care for him. And for quite a few months, she's supposed to be caring. And the baby is hardly growing and skinny and unhealthy and, and illness and whatever else. And fortunately, somebody comes and helps out. And it was a very un, uh, unsatisfactory situation. So she finally goes there and uh, after quite a few months, and she sees that he's not OK. Uh, I'm trying to think whether Asilo goes with her. I can't. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, but so she stays with him for a while, and then she leaves him again. And she goes back again to, to the hospital and, and, and to the, because by this time, she's a, a partisan in the revolution. She's totally devoted to, to Rome and to the, the Italian, the idea of Italian unity, which, as you know, loses. At this time, it loses. Later on, it wins, but it loses. Um, so it, it, this, I'm thinking, you know, and you would be thinking, she's not good at this. She doesn't really get what it is, and he does. He really does. So he then, the second time, he goes and says, this is not OK. And by this time, the revolution has ended. So they go to Florence. And the three of them live a, a mother, father, baby. And uh, they get some friends who are OK with it. And uh, uh, they kind of have the beginning of a normal life. Uh, but um, she's not making a lot in her um, uh, uh, Tribune foreign correspondence, and he's not making a living, and she's convinced that they have to go back to go to the states, and so she starts writing letters, and all of her friends, including Emerson, write back and said, "Don't come," because by this time they know that he's uneducated, uh, he's not going to be able to fit into the social world where she needs to succeed. Uh, this is going to be really hard, and it sounds like you have a better life there. But she says that she's going to uh, beat fate, that everything has been happening to her. And now she's going to decide, and she's going to go back there, and she's going to make it work. So they sign up to go on a, uh, a freighter, which is what they could afford. And it would take two months. And they set sail in, uh, in uh, da, 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 da. March um, 1850. The three of them, this little boy now is I'm picturing two years old. I, I, I mean, I can get all these exact dates from notes, but I'd rather keep going. Uh, I, I'm picturing two years old, maybe, maybe one and a half. Uh, and so they're on this freighter. And the, right away, the captain comes down with Typhus? Anyway, a serious, um, uh, uh, serious disease, highly infectious. All right, and he's put off into a room, and he dies. And the, uh, the second uh, mate, who's never sailed a freighter before, uh, is now going to make this two-month trip. Might have been OK, except that as they come up the coast, and the, of the eastern shore of the United States, a tremendous storm comes. Right. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a freighter like we see going in and out here. This has sails. Right? And a tremendous storm comes. It batters the ship. The sails get knocked off. The ship is going this way and that way. People are getting thrown overboard. All right? And then the ship breaks apart. And uh, Osilo says, I will go and jump in and uh, get rescue or get a boat or something because they're only 50 yards from Fire Island, Long Island, 50 yards, OK? But he goes and absolutely disappears, along with lots of other people. And the steward, who is very affectionate to them and this little boy, says, I will hold the boy safe for you at which time a wave comes and throws both of them overboard. And the last person on the ship 
the one who felt sucked into uh, uh, Niagara Falls, is sitting in her nightshirt with her hair in her face, holding on to a pole when the ship goes down. So 50 yards from Long Island, Margaret Fuller is drowned. So one of the things that many people know about Margaret Fuller is she was a friend of Emerson and she drowned at age 40, 50 yards from uh, Fire Island. All right. And what is all that premonition about she's going to drown, she's going to drown, I mean, at least five or six times she's written about being pulled into the water, about being, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know. Um, um, in a piece that I wrote recently on classical American philosophers and Emerson, I said, I wish Steiner had knew about her. Maybe he could have figured out what was her karma, <laughs> such that this great figure who was really, you know, really on her own now. She was not a friend of the transcendentalists. She was her own powerful, radical, feminist voice. And down. Um, it's really tough. Um, so then the um, um, Emerson gets the news, and he, uh, he can't believe it, and he can't accept it. It's a little bit like with his wife, uh, 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 Ellen, all over again. And he, I mean, he actually dispatches uh, Thoreau, um, who was, you know, his junior, and who was basically lived in his house half the time, uh, to go to the scene and be sure that this is true and, and just come back and tell me whatever you can tell me. And he goes, Thoreau goes, and finds that the, you know, the few people who survived were able to, you know, uh, swim 50 yards is not that, that far for a good swimmer. Um, and so he meets people uh, who knew this and that, and by this time everybody in the area knows. Uh, but there were people on the shore with boats, and they didn't rescue them. And it becomes clear to Thoreau that they were waiting for the ship to go down to gather up the debris. And so when Thoreau goes into the house of this couple who live right on the shore, it's full of stuff from ships that had gone down. I know. Uh, he, he didn't find anything from Margaret. He found uh, Osilis, Osilos, uh, a button from his Italian Marquis jacket, and that's all. Uh, and then uh, there's another chapter. Uh, um, Greeley writes to Emerson and says, all of you who knew her, uh, uh, along with me, you must edit her writings and something about her right away, because everybody is, she's still alive in the culture. So do something. So uh, three of them, um, uh, uh, good friends, Emerson, Channing, and um, Emerson, Channing, and Clark, um, then set out to edit. And uh, this book by this really great, um, very devoted feminist, Belgale Chavigny, um, says it is one of the mo foremost deeds of hubris in the history of editing. They, they copied parts of her letters and diary, et cetera, that, and, uh, that seemed to be OK. They left out words. They changed words. Uh, and um, Channing made her into a Christian. Uh, uh, and um, Clark, Freeman Clark, uh, said, yes, she was very powerful, very strong, but she did, wasn't really virtuous. and. Uh, and, uh, and basically condescending. Uh, Emerson was the best of the three, and he said she was, I, I wrote down, he said, what, what did he say? Uh, not so good that when he heard she died, he said, I have lost my audience. I wish he had said something better than that. I hope he did. Um, uh, <laughs> it's not about you, Ralph. OK. Um, so. Uh, he praised her strength of mind, and he referred to her as a right, brave, and heroic woman. Uh, all three of them made a point of saying that she uh, uh, and uh, uh, Angelo were married before she conceived little Nino, which they knew was not true. 
so it was, it was the way she was wasn't okay with them. They had to fix her up for this, for the culture, for whatever. And they thought they were doing a good thing. Um, but it's, it, because she's theirs to, to um, you know, fix the statue a little bit. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to read a piece by a good friend of mine, Dan McKinnon. Uh, okay, 445. Uh, so, when um, I get, read, get to the end of this, I see my friend being quoted. He's the, he's the Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, professor at Harvard Divinity School. So, I said, uh, Dad, that was really great to read you on the last page of this big fat book. And he says, he was, we were together at this conference on Fuller several years ago, and I gave a talk, and he said, uh, do you have a paper? And he said, no, I just gave the talk. He said, well, send me something. Uh, and so he sent this, and I think it's just a really wonderful uh, ending. Uh, he says, um, oh, okay, this is now um, Madison quoting D Dan McCannon. Uh, Harvard Divinity School lecturer Dan McCannon not just lecturer, the Ralph Waldo Emerson professor, uh, has suggested that now that Marxist attempts to rewrite the social contract have been repudiated across the globe, the next hope for radical reform might benefit from a strong infusion of Fuller's ideals. The next upsurge toward reform and human redemption might carry at its heart some of Fuller's dearest principles, a sincere antipathy to violence and cruelty a belief in power of art and literature to assist in social change, and above all, a confidence that the best, most durable revolution begins with the liberal education of every human being. It remains possible that the author of Woman in the 19th Century may yet become the woman of the 21st century. I thought that was quite a good ending. So that's the lecture, and we have time for discussion, comments, questions, objections. It's a big story, right? I know. Really, I would do anything for some water. Who's you going to do that, Becca? Thanks. So, none of you knew this before. You knew maybe not, not even much. Not much. Okay, a little bit. Huh? I just knew of her because I read her yeah. book. I yeah. read Lots of people know her. If you know about <laughs> Emerson, you hear about her. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, what I'm wondering is uh, if you can talk a little bit about where she may have influenced the ideas of other writers, you know, whether she influenced Emerson or influenced any people in ways that we would, we maybe hadn't recognized before. I think that her, her influence is almost, well, I was going to say one thing, but I actually have to say two. Almost entirely her feminism and her critique of male privilege and blindness to women and education, etc. But I think she also then came to be important as a, um, a, a radical social um, theorist and activist as a result of her years in Italy. Another way to say this is she became far more powerful when she got free of the guys and off on her own in Italy where she didn't, you know, she wasn't a friend of Emerson where she was a foreign correspondent. And she also, and I think this is really important, uh, she became extremely practical. It started when she was a journalist in Manhattan. But then she became, I think, even more when she was in Italy and became rather impatient with uh, transcendentalist idealism and romantic thought. She really felt, yeah, this is nice, but in the meantime, there are thanks so much. There are people who are starving and killing each other and wake up. And the transcendentalists, like romantics generally, are very good up here and not so good on, you know, on the ground. So yeah, the influence, I think, it's not, you can't say, well, she was one of the transcendentalists, so she must have influenced Emerson. No, I don't think so. Right. Because all of his life, and I love Emerson, I really do, but all of his life, he remained pretty oblivious to what in feminist literature is called context. She, he was oblivious to context. And, um, yeah, okay. So, 
How about as a war correspondent? Sorry. Oh, how, how about as a correspondent from Italy? I mean, did how did how were some of her dispatches received back in the U.S.? Were they? Well, they, they must have been received all right because she kept writing, and he kept he kept her on. You know, if you, if you get a correspondent who's writing what readers don't want, then you get a lot of letters. Um, so she was successful and, and a good writer, not a great writer, um, but successful. Yeah, and I, I think Greeley was good. I mean, he, he, he really had a good sense of social justice. He was kind of proud of himself for having the first female correspondent. Before that, the first female reporter, journalist, writer, etc. cetera. Uh, and that was good. Yeah. Uh, Matt? I'm curious about part of the story. Am I wrong in remembering Emerson also being in Europe around 1848 when the revolutions were happening? That's not in my head. Um, he did. He did go and visit uh, Wordsworth. He made two trips. Two trips. Yes. Wordsworth. Yes. Orange, and then later, I thought he wrote about the revolutions in 1848. Uh, but w when he was there, or after? When he was there. Yeah. It's very confusing for me, because there's nothing that I've read about her writing about their correspondence, about his being there when she was. Okay, well, I'm imagining he would not have gone in the middle of a revolution. Oh, he could have gone to England. He was in England. In and England, he yeah. to go see what was happening in France. OK. Um, in 48, mm -hmm. yeah. And it made him sort of uneasy with political revolution because of right. the blood in the streets and how it didn't actually accomplish anything. Right. No, he wouldn't like revolution. Yeah. <laughs> he was very patrician. Um, so I'm trying to think, why have I not read a letter from him to her or her to him about his being in England when she's in Italy? I haven't. I've now read a lot of letters. I'll go, I'll go check Richardson's. That would be fun, yeah. Yeah, right. Steph. Yeah, I don't know. Um, a little louder. I don't, don't have it clear. I'm thinking of a lot of things. Karma, life, uh, yeah. freedom. Um, if she was good in one colony, you know, so many things that a life story can can bring up, you know, so many dimensions of life and the inexplicable mystery, but I don't know how to refer my question, but it's I, all about that. I, I don't either. <laughs> no, man, I don't. I don't. That's, it's, uh, I don't know what to make of it. It's kind of haunting. It's sad. It's haunting. I mean, it's very positive that she got this feminism started, but why, why would she die at 40 in such a crazy way, clinging? So much suffering. Huh? So much suffering. So much suffering? Right till the end. Well, what does she say at the end? She says, um, uh, this, uh, that they, they heard her say, um, uh, it'll take me too long. They, the, one of the two guys who, a steward or somebody else who survived, heard her say something really, this tragic sense. Um, it'll come to me, but I can't get it right now. But the sad thing is, after she died, quite a few people said it was better that she died. Elizabeth Barrett Browning said that. Lydian Emerson said it. She was not going to have a life in the United States. She was the a mother of an illegitimate child as she married to an uneducated man. Uh, what did she think? She should have stayed there and et cetera. And yeah, pretty widespread. And then they, these guys around her had to dress up that, you know, she really uh, was married first, honest. Gee, gosh, you didn't see the, et cetera. Yeah, there is a marriage certificate that, uh, I would say is, uh, uh, Sturgis, she sent to Sturgis, All right? Um, and it's clear, it's, marriage was after she was pregnant. Um, it's hard, hard. It's a hard, a karmically, it's very hard. I know, and not well served. Yes, Daniel. So did she have any relationship to the uh, Mary Wollstonecraft or the, you know, the early feminists yeah. with Mary? Shelley and you know she, the. She, I mean, the, the, the only one that she, the only one that's mentioned, insofar as I've read, um, is George Sand, 
and uh, you know, who's the lover of uh, Chopin. She heard Chopin play, and she was very excited by Sand's sexuality. They had a conversation, and she really became sexually uh, liberated in Italy. She, she talked about how uh, on the street she would see uh, women nursing their, their young and, and uh, couples you know, touching each other and just being Italian. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and she said, wow, this is not like Concord. You know, everybody's up like this, you know. Uh, and she really got, got liberated. And then next thing you know, she had a lover, and then she had a baby. But she didn't know Wollstonecraft's... I, no mention. No. No, no mention, Wollstonecraft. Wollstonecraft, uh, 211, 269. <laughs> <laughs> I, and two, yeah, I didn't remember that. A lot of names in the book, right? Jamie, were there particular social or feminist agendas that she was a part of in the states? Like any specific political things that she the wanted? The major develop? thing for her was education for girls and the possibility of a career based on that. But uh, you know. Most of these, you couldn't, I mean, most of these women didn't get to, I mean, uh, I'm trying to get the dates right, but uh, Tamar March, who's a uh, board member of uh, CIS, who you know, uh, did a PhD in, at Harvard, uh, and she later became the dean of Radcliffe, but when she was a graduate student, she couldn't go into the stacks. That's in our lifetime. I know. Uh, so I mean, we're, we're, we're used to stuff that is pretty new, <laughs> shockingly new, right? Um, yeah. Uh, but there were a huge number of doctors, women doctors, educated at the turn of the century. We were very surprised to learn. And it was a, 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 a hospital in Philadelphia that was producing many women doctors. And what happens, as you know, is that um, the, there's a certain breakthrough, and then there's something, some social something or other, like it could be a, a financial crisis or, you know, like, so all, of, all these women had these great jobs during the war. And right after the war, a, so Rosie the Riveter was sent back into the kitchen. And all that was lost. And that stopped all over again in the 60s. So she had some breakthroughs, and then, boom, not that fast, which is like civil war, civil rights as well. So yeah, for her, the big thing was was uh, the education and the fruits of education institutionally, right? Then she got to know a lot. Of, oh, she visited a prison in New York. Oh, and she got talking to the to the women, many of whom were in in prison because of having been. Uh, abused and then um, uh, arrested uh, by men, right? And that, that really radicalized her when she, she didn't know anything about that. <clears throat> so yeah, she got a very good education in Manhattan. Reporters know all kinds of, reporters and police know all kinds of things. I know police are not too popular this week, but they, they, uh, they have amazing knowledge about what's going on, and, and reporters too. You know, people with the night beat, they usually know each other. Um, okay. Yes, Becca. I just wanted to add a comment of following up on what Jamie said, that it was in 1837 that Mount Holyoke College was started in Massachusetts, which was the first women's college in the U.S. Right. Um, the same year that Emerson and Thoreau met, I believe. That Emerson? And Thoreau met. Um, so 37? 37. 37. 37. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so it was all kind of happening right at the same time. Yep. I, I wonder if you know if she, I mean, that was only 13 years before her death, if she would have visited at all or had any. Good question. Uh, so 37, she was 27. Yeah. Um, good question, and I don't know. I mean, since you're saying that she wasn't, it, Mount Holyoke was started as a seminary for right. women, and so right. I imagine she might have some resistance to that. They wouldn't have wanted her. Right. She was not a Christian. I don't think she was even, she was baptized. She had no Christian education. She had no interest in Christianity. 
Testament. She doesn't never talks about Jesus or the New Testament at all. So the parents couldn't bring her up as no. were they no, he the father was not. The father was a classicist mm -hmm. entirely and did not educate her like she was learning, studying Latin. It wasn't to translate Augustine. That's pretty, that's pretty Very exceptional. Mm -hmm. Right. He wanted her to get ahead, but actually doing the New Testament in that culture probably was a good way to get ahead. But he really was devoted to the classics and the mother had no opinion. She was not she was not a factor in those decisions. Very passive generally, but also didn't know as much as he did, because hardly anybody did. Yeah, very, and she got in a lot of trouble for not being, I mean, again and again and again, the Christians pounce on her. There's a lot, I mean, yeah. Um, Emerson was not like that. He was not polemical, not contentious. So although he was an ex when he reads the divinity school of huh? <laughs> how can you say that when he goes in and gives the divinity school divinity school of address. address yeah uh, but he wasn't I mean he wasn't attacking persons he was giving and even then you could say it's critical but even more it's uh, hortatory it's it's romantic and uh, you know he says of course how could how, you know uh, we have we can't be dependent on Europe, et cetera, et cetera. But he's, he's really calling for a, a, new, a new paradigm, a new uh, w vision. Polemical enough to get him banned from Harvard for decades. Yes, I know, but that, not only was it unwarranted, it was very foolish. <laughs> Since the, the, the most famous graduate <laughs> in their history uh, was banned for 30 years. Uh, but that, most of the faculty were clergy. Uh, so you're right, Daniel, he was, he was, he had very strong convictions, but he was not a contentious person, in my opinion. Uh, in fact, he had a lot of trouble um, weighing in on, on the, uh, slavery, and because he was really horrified by the abolitionists, who he thought were just sort of out of control, dogmatic, radical, absolute, whatever. He did then perform well, but he was, it took him a while, and then he had to do it on his own terms. 1837, I think he wrote to Van Buren uh, and said, you're on the wrong side, this, this has to stop. 37 was pretty good. 37, he was only, yeah, he was 30, 34. So she did leave Mary Wollstonecraft. She did. Women in the 19th century was compared to uh -huh. Wollstonecraft. I'd forgotten that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I didn't say she was. It was she was the first document. It was the first do document in America. Right. Yeah. And what what year was Wollstonecraft? Yeah, I think it was. Um, I'm not sure the exact year, but it's. Um, 1890. Say it again. Wow. Amazing. Great, yeah. And Shelley? Yeah. That's a little later. Yeah. That's like 18. Uh, yeah. Mm. Right. I wrote about both of them. So <laughs> but one, one of the things I think about her feminism is that it really comes from her experience. You know, she more and more she's writing what she knows from being blocked. She's so many times, she's blocked because of her gender. And that's what leads her, that's what it almost, the insight comes, you know, just pressed on her by circumstance. And it was a little different, it seems, in, in Europe. It was more different, more, a little more open there. I think than, so. Than in <coughs> I think so. The East Coast, there. and I'm not certain of the, of the difference. I mean, they were both Christian, uh, but one of the puritanical, huh? Not Puritan. puritanical, not puritanical, and not maybe slightly less uh, fiercely economic. And it clearly was advantageous for the women to hold the family while the men could make a lot of money. 
That, that was the model. <coughs> to, to keep the family solidarity, especially with a lot of movement across country, there's a big, big value in, I'm not, I'm not how far I pushed that. And I don't know what the other reasons would be, but it certainly was true that the pushback was pretty intense. And that, that she wasn't married and that she wasn't a Christian and it was just really it was almost as bad as being a female. It was pretty fierce. And, and the women who of course had interiorized all this, as we now know, but they didn't have that language. When did Hawthorne write the Scarlet Letter? When, Sorry, I didn't when hear. When did Hawthorne write that? When does the Scarlet Letter come out? Uh, after. Um, yeah, yeah, isn't it, 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 is it? Huh? That's later. Yeah, yeah. That's, a pretty vivid picture. That's right. But um, Hawthorne, uh, uh, Hawthorne's wife Sophia uh, liked uh, Fuller and kind of supported her. I mean, she had a lot of prominence. Uh, but uh, Hawthorne um, was extremely uh, negative toward Fuller and thought she was uh, homely and impolite and a pain, and uh, there was no excuse for her. It was really, really blunt. He was very, they were kind of precious. They were gorgeous physically, and then he became so famous, and they lived in a nice in this house in the manse, and, um, and so he was a pretty elite. Um, yeah. 50? Yeah, I had it at 52, but 50. Like against I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the, but earlier, the Blythdale romance was a, um, uh, basically a critique of Brook Farm, which we didn't talk about. Yes, Elizabeth. Wasn't Hawthorne against like, women writers in general? Or elaborate. Wasn't Hawthorne against women writers in general? Yes. Like he wrote, like, there's a plague of scribbling women upon yes. us. Yes, yeah. yes, he was very, yeah. I thought it was, uh, uh, Hawthorne was not that nice. <laughs> What a great writer. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Um, we didn't talk about Brook Farm. She didn't like Brook Farm because everybody went who was at Brook Farm, first off, they're idealists and kind of romantic, and she thought hopelessly um, sort of uh, impractical, uh, but also because everybody had to work, and she didn't have the strength to do that, to do that kind of work. And it was much too democratic, and she was pretty elite herself. <laughs> So she wanted people to be as smart as she was. She wasn't interested in, in the dishes. So if this was a big dinner party, she'd have been in the living room and not in the kitchen. Yeah. Kat, I'm sorry? I always appreciate your ability to uh, make historical figures human. Um, uh -huh. um, but I was thinking that um, in her case, she could be a very modern woman. I mean, uh, the things that happened to her. There's something we don't accept about um, the universe distributing intelligence randomly. So she got some of it, even though she was a woman. Yeah. Um, and then she, she lived in a particular family, which distorted everything right. for her. Yeah, yeah. And, and the way you learn um, certain things, I mean, she learned the intellectual stuff first and maybe never learned the social, or was on her own when she did. And, uh, you know, because I can contrast her experience with my own, with other people I know, the order in which you learn certain things, or whether you're too isolated from right. what, what is going on in your right. culture, or even your family, um, uh, creates a certain kind of of distorted personality. Uh, yep. So you just get what you get, in a sense, uh, in the order in which it occurred historically for you. Right. Uh, and, uh, and it seems to me suffering is also distributed kind of, I, I won't even say randomly, too many of us have to endure some aspect of it. But you know, when you are, when you grow up feeling blessed in a way. Intelligence is such a blessing. Right. You kind of think nothing bad is supposed to happen. Yeah. Uh, and yet all these really intelligent people had to suffer just like everybody else. And uh, I don't know what it did to their writing. Uh, 
uh, uh, but but you do have a sense if they were so intelligent, so blessed with intelligence, sometimes with wealth as well. Uh, somehow that wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, well, there are lots of different kinds of intelligence, and she had one or two kinds, and she was clearly lacking a couple of others. And that was because the family uh, raised her in a disproportionate way. Well, the, that's, that's what families do. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean they, they kind of <laughs> constrain you and cripple you in, in various ways, and, and the leg heals crookedly, <laughs> you know, and you, you um, once you have a little more discretion, freedom, whatever, uh, you, you make some of your own choices. You make your own choices, but you can't always go back and learn what you were supposed to learn. That, there are, there are stages. In the right some <laughs> child psychologists tell us that there are windows, and it's yeah. very hard to make up for the windows that were closed early in your life. I agree. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's so absolute, but yeah. Yeah, we know those cases. Yeah, once I started talking with her, I mean, you know, she was no longer my brat of a little sister. She, you know, all of a sudden is a university professor, actually. Right. Uh, and uh, I understood my childhood much better because of stuff she told me about child development. Right, yeah, uh, yeah. And, very helpful. And it does, it does matter the order in which you go through um, whatever you are learning about the world, um, uh, and you, whether you have reasonable parents. Uh, but, but, you know. but, I mean, after Margaret knew that she was awkward and annoying, <laughs> she well, didn't have an easy time undoing that. I mean, these are, these are, I mean, she could have done a little more than she did, and she did have some help here and there. Uh, but it's really hard. You have to basically reconstruct a, these core, core experiences and core, etc. But I think so, somebody over here was going to, Kat, yes. I wondered when you say that there was really vicious criticism of her for not being Christian and for right. being who she was, did that come in the form of like writings, public essays or things, or more verbally or... And, um, and, and how did she respond to it? Did it really, did she react to it at all? Or did she just, was she kind of more oblivious and let it go? It, um, <coughs> what I've learned about it is mostly uh, letters uh, about her rather than to her, which is sort of what we would expect. Um, and, uh, and then uh, actions taken against her, like being forced out of some situation or prevented Etc. She had one good experience I didn't mention. She was a, a member of uh, a gr group that included women that Emerson organized. And um, um, she and um, uh, Sophia Hawthorne and uh, Sophia Peabody, uh, those three were involved with like four or five other men in a, like a metaphysical club. This one was called the... Um, the Transcendental Club, which is partly where the name came from. Um, so she was, she was not always blocked, um, but she was often, and very often by women. Yeah. She knew this was happening. This wasn't... This she knew that it was happening. I don't know that she, she knew it would happen. I, I think she always thought, this time it's going to work. This time she's going to be able to teach. She's going to be able to... I didn't tell you that. She had a, a job in the Green School for two years, and it was very hard. I mean, she's, you know, she's not cool, and she's teaching teenagers, and it was pretty hard. Uh, you know, she didn't look right. Um, she didn't look horrible, but she, you know, um, she was not their role model by any means, but it, the, the, uh, Madison makes a point that uh, when she told them she was leaving, the, uh, the, um, all, the, the entire class was crying and expressed great love for her and whatever. Which is a little surprising, because um, people that age can be hard. But they weren't. They saw her devotion to, her, to them. That was a good thing. Yeah, she had some good things here and there, but mostly they were small compared to the big things that were really hard. Blocked, 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 blocked. 
And I didn't tell you all the things that went wrong with the money, and I did a little bit, I guess, with the Uncle Abraham, and then the farm was a catastrophe, and then she had this ne'er-do-well brother, and everybody just, just basically just wiping her out. Steph? I have a uh, question. If you would think what kind of myth that what, what is behind her life, what would you say? Like a myth <laughs> that it's like, that she's reviving. <coughs> she, she is, I think, almost completely the, the, lo the male uh, hero's journey in a culture that did not permit female heroes. She really, she really had that lonely genius, I can do it. And the society said, no, you can't. Pretty, not totally, but overwhelmingly, in a way that caused a lot of suffering and prevented her from a big impact. I mean, she did write this book, you know, and a lot of other smaller pieces as well. That was great. So in that sense, she wasn't prevented. It was actually Horace Greeley who published it. Um, but she could have been so much more if she hadn't been blocked. And yet some people say, of course, that it's only by conflict that you grow. Well, she had plenty of conflict. Uh, I don't know if she needed as much as she had. Daniel, are you cooking something? No. OK. Did she ever uh, write poetry at all? Not much. Well, it's very, very little. Very little. Um, and the fiction pieces that she wrote were really uh, uh, with a point. Women who broke break through, or women who were blocked, or was it was, see, you see what I'm talking about? Like that, yeah. Right. How you doing, how you doing? I'm wondering if you think she would have thought that she accomplished something in her life. Mm. What you think she would have thought about her? There were quite a few times when she said she hadn't. But she did say that the uh, uh, woman in 19th century left her print on the earth. I think she was very proud of that. So it's taken into account her upbringing uh, with her father. Right. And so having sort of skewed standards, probably not a lot of self-confidence. She was desperate for approval. Right. You know, I mean, if you do Jungian talk, her animus was really distorted right. early on. She, she needed a male fit. She says to Emerson, I, I wrote to you as a father. And, and you know, he went, woo, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I sense a sort of like a, a difficult relationship with attachment and detachment yes. from childhood, from having such a depressed mother, having a father who exactly. their only relationship was really there was this big boundary. Intellectual, there. yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and so the marriage, sociologically, the marriage makes no sense. But psychologically, it makes a lot of sense. He was this kind man yeah. and a good father. I mean, she was. And on the ship, she was exposing Nino to the, these contagion, and he was furious with her and, and said, are you, are you going to endanger our son again? So she finally found a way to be her yes. and be in relationship yes, with she was. who were tied to her and just who were with her just because the, they loved her. He loved her and she loved him. And that's beautiful. So yes. in a way, it's like she did accomplish something and she kind of went down on top. In a way. In a way. <laughs> yes, yes. I know. It was, not, it was not what she set out to do. But she kept inventing herself to see if there's an opening. Maybe there's an opening here, an opening here. I know. I know I'll be a teacher. I know I'll be a writer. I'll be a journalist. I know I'll, etc. She's trying. She did. And if you strive, the angels will save you in the end. Well, they, yeah, but she may, she may drown but be lifted. I, I think even nowadays, um, a, a woman with intelligence has to say, if she's looking for a mate, can I take care of my own intellectual needs and I just need to look for somebody who meets my yep. emotional needs. So what she did was very, it may have seemed brave at that time, right. but it, it, it makes perfect sense. Make, uh, it makes perfect sense for her personally in isolation, it doesn't make sense in the society in which she had to make, make her way. We get one more question. 
part of the whole story. With, it, it fits completely with the story of ultimately the culture that she was trying to do this in at the time was mostly not prepared. No. And even the nice ones were not and I able. Think, and, and if I look at if I look at the whole picture, what she contributed is what we're doing tonight. Because we get to talk about what that was like. Yeah. And and she's the one who gave it to us. And you thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, I think she made a great contribution. I, I really do. Um, I just wish it had been easier for her. But anyway, thank you all for coming. Great, we got our... Thank you for... sharing my enthusiasm for Margaret. <laughs>